position. Stand up for us. What? Stand up for us. I coalesce the vapor of human experience into a fireful and logical comprehension. Oh, a bullshit artist. Mm. Did you bullshit last week? No. Did you try to bullshit last week? Yes. And as an add-on to this topic of the transmission line not with the reflective pulse not causing a change at the uh, receiver or transmitter, here's the Megabucks Laboratory Grade Tektronics TDR. And here's the pulse on the left. That's the incident pulse on the pulse head going through this short cable out through three meters of cable, <laughs> pardon me, to a dummy lobe, a couple of connectors. Along that line at the top, we don't really see anything significant. It looks pretty much flat. If we sweep it out, we see a little artifact here. And when we increase the magnification and really sweep it out, we see that. Well, that's, that's looking along the time that the signal is propagating along that transmission line. Is it a a bad spot in the line? No. This is why we got to have good tight coax connectors. The rules for these SME connectors are they're supposed to be tight with a special wrench. I've left these connectors loose. I've unscrewed the SMA and I've unscrewed and backed off the BNC. Okay, I can't do this all at once but here's here's the view about half a division wide about a division high then after tightening them, the pulse on the left side has pretty much disappeared. That's why it's real important to have these connectors tight. Because what makes, what defines the outer conductor and the diameter of the conductors and the characteristic of the line is the end of that barrel pressing up against the inside there. It's not the screw threads and not this outer shell. Those are intended to push those two surfaces together in here and if they come out of alignment or the or the energy has to travel out to this part down here then that defines a different characteristic of connector that makes a discontinuity that doesn't look like much of a disturbance until you figure that step there is a kilowatt and that, now a couple of crappy old connectors are putting several watts worth of RF trash in the ham shack with a receiver with microvolt sensitivity or some other sensitive equipment but uh, here it is with proper dummy lobe and we see the incident pulse is one of two major divisions one minor that's 10 20 30 40 50 that suggests 50 ohms when the dummy loads unscrewed and removed that's an open-ended transmission line and here that first step on the left is where that little discontinuity was because of the loose connectors. It's just that the sweep is much wider now to see the entire incident pulse. You can see there's still 10, 20, 30, 40, two and a half divisions. That's 50 ohms there. Sweep it out a bit. But then where that second step is, <laughs> that's the end of the cable. So here is where the end of the cable is. That's where that little blip was. We can't see it because it sweeps way out. Over there. Actually, this is the start of the pulse. This is the length of the cable. Notice the cable is about a division and a half wide. That's how far in time it is. And the setting is sweeping it further out. And at 5 nanoseconds per vertical division, that's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, the length of that cable is 28 nanoseconds long. This illustrates what the textbook said. Transmission lines operate in the time and distance. So there's the start of the TDR pulse from the pulse head going onto that line, that the 3 meter line. It travels along that 3 meter line in 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 28 nanoseconds. And the sees the end of that cable is open and there's a huge reflection. <clears throat> There's the reflection at a mismatched antenna, grossly mismatched antenna. 
the cable's reciprocal. It'll be exactly the same amount of time out as it will back, with no magic to it. So let's move this one, two, three, four, five, six divisions towards the left and look and see what happens at the time. So we'll just basically move it the entire half width of the screen over and see what that trace is doing at the time the pulse returns to the receiver. <clears throat> so the pulse is coming out of the pulse generator over this short nanosecond jumper. Out this three meter cable that finds the open end it comes back the same amount of time back to the detector input. So here is a dither that suggests that that's the input. I'll increase the gain here. Is it the same time? One, two, three, four, five. It's the same time. So this is where the pulse has left that open end of the cable where the dummy load used to be. And let's come back to the sampling head. There's a little perturbation there that's minor. It's more than when the connectors were loose. You see there, there's this complex of two connectors and this detector inside. Do you see any subsequent reflection? This is a reflection over here. That's a reflection caused by the far end of the line, which would correspond with the antenna, causing a big reflection. <clears throat> Do you see this mythical pulse causing a big mismatch in the receiver? And this is the same thing as a radio receiver. This is the transmitter here, that's the receiver. It's just they don't happen at exactly the same time. Do you see any big step change like that indicating that the pulse was again reflected at the receiver? You do not. All you see is a little discontinuity from these cheap Chinese connectors and cables. A real cable set to really do this would be big bucks. I, I can't justify it. But I'll sweep this out further, <clears throat> further, 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 further. A little change of magnitude. But there's no magical, no such thing as this magic discontinuity or mismatch of the load causing a, a change in impedance at the input. It's BS and myth. Okay, here's our original view. Far left, zero. The incident pulse stepping up there at about three-quarter division. The at uh, at about 20, 40, 50 ohms. There's a link to that 50 ohm line. And then this huge discontinuity, which is another 50. <clears throat> that means it's the same energy coming back. Little roll off here due to frequency losses. And now I'm going to show you what clamping a magical ferrite to the cable does. You know the ham myth about uh, something about currents down the shield and ferrites and noise and all that crap? Now that's also a pile of horse manure. So I'll start with the open line case since it's already there. We know the length of that cable going out is there. So any effects on clamping the magic ferrite will happen in the one and the third divisions going this way to that point right there. It'll be in here. There's a the magic ferrite layered suppressor core, HF suppressor core. Excellent suppressor core. Anything change there? It did not. There's a forward trip one of third divisions, the return trip, one and the third, there's a slight discontinuity here at the connectors. Nothing. And I'll take it off, you can see it again. Notice the sag in the waveform. Zip, not a nothing. Now I'll, exp I'll expand it out so we can see it better. I'll expand the sweep from the rise at the left, five and a half divisions to the right, so to the center, and just a little bit to the left, see that little bobble there? That magic ferrite is at about the center graticule here. And while you're watching, I'm going to clamp it on. Nothing changed. This is the same view in the same location with the dummy load attached. You don't see the big step from the open transmission line. I'm going to snap the clamp on. Nothing happened.
Okay, the <clears throat> proof. Proof that a reflection at the load causes a magic mismatch at source is a lie. I proved to you that that was a fiction created by the four authors to establish a notion of reflected power where it could not be established with a proper load. They did that for a reason, but then they go on and fix the problem. This is not ham myth. And they're full of you know what when they talk about their magic ferrite clamps. And this is not ARL, not MFJ, not Mickey Mouse. It don't get any better than that. So, laboratory. This setup was $50,000 in the late 1980s. This ain't toys. Real components, I know how to use them. These things that we've been taught are myths, BS, and in some case, lies to sell stuff. Anybody, almost anybody with a few bucks can afford a TDR. A W2AEW shows how to, on YouTube, how to approximate this with a scope and a signal source. It's not quite the same, but it works. And scopes and signal generators are, are easy to get. But notice the people pushing these fairy tales never, ever prove it. It's because, like, uh, when Chuck gets around making his video about his antennas, he spent 500 bucks on magic antenna parts from, from people selling antennas proclaiming to be experts, and when it didn't work, he contacted them and found they know nothing about it. And boy, he was mad. <laughs> So there it is, absolute proof. KBYP did that.